Welcome to Crushgasm, the podcast dedicated to the highs and lows of crushes. From their first to their worst, we're going to cover them all with a cascade of characters, including our guest today, the music god himself, CJ Plain, a music fanatic who doubles as an avid book lover. He's also a single dad of five kiddos and an expert in all things smartass, who is here to talk not only about his YouTube channel that features his reactions, concert footage, and interviews, but also his May-December crush that gave him a new attitude the icon herself, Patty LaBelle. CJ, how are you? I am amazing and uh, I'm so uh, honored to be here and to get to participate with you and laugh and have fun and share incredible stories about an incredible person. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I I was really excited. I've been waiting. This has been on my list since I started the podcast. No one's ever done it first time. But before we get into this May December crush that spans back to middle school for you, can you tell us where we can find you and the Music God Reacts and the Noise Report online? Music God Reacts and the Noise Report are both uh, on my YouTube channel. I just uh, youtube.com slash Music God Reacts. Or you can just type in Music God Reacts into Google and a lot of my videos will pop up. Uh, you'll see, I think most of the time, the ones that pop up are like the Nightwish reaction for High Hopes and then the Dimash uh, Endless Dimensions video, I think are the two big ones that pop up a lot. So um, you'll see my ugly Viking looking self with the, you know, long hair and the beard and looking like Ragnar Rothrock so <laughs> <laughs> so like you just had to google a great place to find anything in life nowadays yeah so. <laughs> um, you can find anything I, I you know I've turned it into a brand and it's kind of become bigger I mean it started at, the, the name started as a running joke in middle school but I just you know when I got into music everybody says you gotta have a brand and okay i made it a brand and um you know so uh yeah <laughs> it's it's my brand now you know so well this nickname that became your brand started in middle school and that's when you kind of discovered patty labelle you yeah. it was back in 1984 how did you come across new attitude was it like the radio a record store mtv it was actually uh one of the songs on beverly hills cop soundtrack and um, the song was in Beverly Hills Cop and, you know, MTV being what it was at the time, they showed it a ton. Uh, I knew of Patty before then, but from um, uh, Lady Marmalade and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, and from, you know, LaBelle, the group and all of that. So I knew her more from the Motown side, but I mm -hmm. didn't visually know her really per se you know what i'm saying like yeah occasional pictures of the uh disco type of stuff that they released uh for lady marmalade and that kind of stuff uh so i wasn't really into that style of music kind of per se so i didn't pay a lot of attention to it um mm -hmm. but when new attitude come out it was kind of like okay i was starting to get into more stuff and the video, you know, she's got all the different looks she does. She's got the, you know, the the kind of mohawkish type hairdo, and then she's got the short, punky one, and the kind of Tina Turner hair, and she she showcases so many different styles and looks in the video, and it really just showcased not just her singing ability, which is out of this world, but it showcased her personality. You know, because mm -hmm. her, her personality really is as big as her music, you know, so uh, that's what sets Patty apart, I think, from a lot of the quote unquote diva style singers is, you know, they just had, she has a personality that's bigger than life and goes with the music that's bigger than life. So um, it, it kind of sets her on a different level than say Gladys Knight or Dionne Warwick or, or, or those singers who are again all amazing singers mm -hmm. but you know Gladys's personality isn't nearly as big as say Patty's or Aretha's 
so there, there's you know as they say there's levels to the game so <laughs> <laughs> well, you're mentioning her larger than life personality but you also mentioned all these looks in the video and when i was like on the the google as i do the album cover for this um single she is serving 80s glamour to a T and she has this like mm -hmm. short skirt so I can imagine being like about 13 at the time and seeing this and being all, maybe a little hot and bothered as a 13 year old boy going through all those changes and obviously you had to have known she was like older than you but did you know that almost 30 years separated you and this newfound crush? Oh yeah like I, <laughs> I was fully aware of how old she was um because the odd thing was is it wasn't only Patty uh kind of around the same time Shaka Khan came out with mm. I feel for you and Shaka was kind of the other one so I had this sort of wall of you know it was <laughs> it was posters of Shaka Khan and in Patty LaBelle and my friends made fun of me because my one friend said well why Patty LaBelle and not Tina Turner because you know mm. Tina was blowing up then too and Tina's amazing but I don't know, there was just something about Patty, man, that was bigger than life, you know? And then when you explore a little bit, like I did, I started, I asked my Uncle Marty, I said, okay, you know, I really like Patty LaBelle. And, oh, you mean blah, 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 blah. And he started telling me all this other stuff and pulling your old records out. And you start, and you start listening to those older records and holy crap, like she could sing. You know, like sing sing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she um, could sing is what we say. Yeah, you know, and as as a white farm kid, you know, <laughs> four hundred acre farm, mm -hmm. so far out into the country that you know, it took us twenty minutes to get to town. It was um you know, I, I grew up on southern rock and country music and classic rock. Mm -hmm. So I was used to people like Joe Cocker and, and people like that, that had big voices. Um, you know, Bob Seger and LaVon Helm and, and people like that. But to hear a woman have that kind of voice, you know, it was something different. And it kind of made me realize that there's a lot more levels to music than just what I had been exposed to at that time, at that age. And it, it it opened up a lot of avenues that I explored later and made me who I am today. You know, like a lot of people assume when they see me, all oh, the long hair, the tattoos, the Viking look that, oh, you're a metalhead. And I am. But, you know, my knowledge is also in R&B. It's in reggae. It's in classical. It's in jazz. It's in blues. You know, I can talk about Bob Marley and and Buju Bantan as much as I can talk about Patti LaBelle and Gladys Knight, Creator and Slayer. I can talk about Johnny Cash and Waylon Jennings. I can talk about Steve Fry and Frank Zappa. You know, there's no limit to my musical tastes. And it's because of Patti, because Patti was kind of that person that kicked all of that off and made me realize that music is kind of like food. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of flavors out there, a lot of variety and a lot of different flavors and tastes. So you can spend your whole life just eating pizza and fries, or you can explore Indian food and Thai food and, and Mexican food and Japanese and, and Chinese and, and realize that, you know, there's a lot that you can put on your plate in, in depending on what mood you're in there's something that's perfect for, for everything. It's a thing you said about 13 is when you started to discover. I think that is that about that age, that middle school age where you kind of break off from what maybe your parents or your family liked and you start to discover your kind of own personality in like hobbies and especially music. I think that's an important thing. I think that's why I like the middle school era. My nephew just started middle school today, so I was very emotional. <laughs> 
I was like, oh my god, he's growing up. I hope, I, and I'm excited to see his personality kind of blossom into more than what his mom and dad like, you know? So I think that's what you got to. But you also said that your uncle, when you started to get into New Attitude, started to show you old records. Say, hey, this is 1984. You couldn't just hop on YouTube or Spotify. Like, you had right. to go to a record store. So was it just your uncle showing you, or did you kind of like be like, when you drove those 20 minutes into town, kind of check out any music stores? I grew up in a very, very small, white country town. Um, I grew up in a town of about 800 people in the thumb of Michigan. Um, We had one black family in town and they were sort of like the Cosby's. Uh, (laughs) Mom was a nurse, uh, dad was a executive for General Motors. And the two boys, they had twin sons, uh, Randy and Ricky, and they were kind of like Urkel. Uh, Before Urkel was a thing, uh, mm-hmm. they were kind of the book smart, nerdy type black kids. And, uh, or, you know, a, blurred would be a, a really good term for them now. Um, yeah, OG blurreds right there. But <laughs> at the, yeah, at the time, you know, they were just kind of there and they didn't, mess with anybody and they didn't really hang out much or go to parties much they were super smart and super studious and never got into trouble and you know as a as the kid who grew up in the family seeing a lot of stuff that i hate now and the reason i left my family behind um you know black people were this and this and this and this and i would always well they're not like that and my grandpa's like, well, that's because you're rich. Okay. You know, and at 13, when that's all you've known, it's kind of like, okay, word is law. But when I went into foster care and started seeing the world and I was away from that bubble, mm-hmm. you know, it was very eye opening to realize that the world is nothing like I was taught, you know, um, cause even growing up in that, I, I didn't, it didn't resonate with me. You know what I'm saying? Like it didn't, it never mattered to me. Like I always loved Patti LaBelle and I always loved Motown and R and B and stuff like that. And I think my grandfather, especially my father, they were very agitated by that. You know, they hated when I watched Chico and the Man and the Sanford, Sanford and Son and stuff like that. You know, and mm-hmm. kind of like, why don't you watch Little House on the Prairie? Why don't you watch Andy Griffith? Oh. Well, I do well, watch. To be fair, those are very two very of the most boring white shows. <laughs> what I'm saying, like it was, it was <laughs> yeah. one of them things, and it wasn't yeah. like how do I explain it? Like it wasn't. What I meant by when I got into the the kind of dust, I would say dust off, but the disagreement with, with DeAndre and CJ over when I said low-key re- racism. What I meant by that is from, I will never see the world from a black perspective because I'm not black. Okay. But what I've seen and where I say it's low-key racism is I've heard the remarks from people on my side of the fence that they would never have the balls to say to an actual black person face to face you know Mm -hmm. so it's low key in the sense of they'll act cool while they're standing there talking to you but as soon as you walk away it's like yip 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 or yip 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 or yip 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 you know and you when you grow up with that and you you're just kind of stuck in it. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. that's kind of what I meant. Like, I've I've seen a lot of racism that Black people would never see because it would never be presented to them because those people would never be brave enough to present it to them. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like where I grew up. There was, you know, you, you hear the term like sundown towns and, and that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I won't say we were a sundown town and there was no ex- 
implicit rule that black people were allowed to live where we lived, but it was stuff like, well, we won't tell you you can't live here. We'll just make it so expensive you can't live here. You know? Oh, mm-hmm. So it was, it was it was shit like that that was kind of always drove me crazy. It irked me. And then again, when I got out into the world and I saw the world for what it was, it was nothing like I had been told or been shown or had been presented to me for those X number of years that I grew up on that farm. I was say, like, so they probably, like, weren't okay with you having this maybe, like, love for Patti LaBelle yeah. and Shaka Khan. But at the same time, it's also, they were a lot older than you. But I don't think it's weird when celebrity crushes are older because... Oh, the whole point of a celebrity crush is like a fantasy. So I I don't think it's weird. But did you find yourself kind of, did that inspire you to always look at older women, even like in real life? No, not. (laughs) I I never actually dated an older woman. Um, It was just, the thing with me is, is when I date someone or when I'm in a relationship with someone, it's never been based on their looks. To me, you can be the most beautiful being on the world. You can be a perfect 10 supermodel penthouse, blah, blah, blah. But if you are dumber than a rock, yeah. you will hold my interest for all of about 30 seconds. Whereas you can look like Patty and maybe Patty isn't the, uh, role model of what a perfect woman is size wise and in for certain aesthetics that some men may find attractive but the personality is there the ability to cook to be a a mother to be a homemaker just to be a, a a badass woman you know and and that is far more attractive to me <laughs> than any looks that you can bring to the table because looks fade yeah and speaking of her personality again it's the 80s you don't have the internet to kind of or there's no internet there's no social media today we know kind of everything about our celebrity crushes that they would like to share with us uh so back then did you know anything about her personal life not much just kind of like what you saw on mtv and what you saw from the older videos you know lady marmalade and that kind of stuff i knew she had been married to her husband since the early 60s or the, the late 60s um so i knew she was married and and that kind of stuff but um again you know this was this was even before her cooking and and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff took on a life of its own yeah those so, patty pies <laughs> yeah and you know in it and again it just it was sort of a smaller crush and then as i got older and you learn more and more and more about her and there's more aspects there's more layers to the onion so to speak she became even more beautiful to me you know and more attractive because you're like holy shit she's not just an amazing singer with a big personality there's all these amazing stories that you hear like when she was on the arsenio show when you you know i saw her in concert a couple of times with luther vandross and um you know you you see these aspects of her personality and you think holy crap you know she really is just a this amazing being who is a ball of energy you know (laughs) And, 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 and like she does all this music and you love that you're the music god but she's also gotten to some tv and movies uh she's on several episodes of a different world i right. she popped up on american horror story when they did the freak show yeah. season uh, did your crush expand outside of music to the point where you're like oh she's gonna be on this show she's gonna be on dancing with the stars i think she's on the mass singer let me check it out yeah like i i tend to pay attention to stuff she does but I don't seek it out per se at this point. Like it kind of just, if it pops up, I'll watch it. Or if I know ahead of time. Um, but at this point, I mean, I, I know what Patty does. So there's not really a whole lot you can tell me that would diminish the crush or, or anything like that, or really to add to it per se. Cause I mean, what more can you add to a woman who, you know, she's a world-class singer. She's, obviously a world-class 
wife and mother because she's been married to her husband since 1969 and they've had you know three children together who are all amazing you know her oldest son is her uh manager her tour manager and all of that you know she's an amazing cook she's got her own food line she's got her own clothing line she's got her own home interior lines i mean how do you add to that like what do you do to kind of make that even bigger than it already is well, you said you don't seek it out, but in 2020, it was really hard to ignore those verses on Instagram where the two yeah. artists would kind of sit down and Her she did it with Gladys. Yeah, yeah. And everyone was very hyped. Did you check that one out? Oh, yeah, I was <laughs> absolutely because I love Gladys. And again, like I said, Gladys, again, is world class. And I, I meant no disrespect to Gladys earlier when I said what I said. But again, there's levels, you know. Um, I love Fantasia, but I wouldn't put Fantasia on the same level as Patty and Aretha. You know what I'm saying? Just because of where they are in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, not diminishing Fantasia's singing one bit, because Fantasia, again, amazing singer. Um, but she's not Aretha and she's not Patty. You know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's I mean. Just, <laughs> There's yeah. very few people who are, uh, I mean, Aretha, I think, what, isn't she always on the like, number one for vocalist yeah. list? Mo mostly, yeah. <laughs> Most um, time. I actually put Patty a little above Aretha, but hey, you know, um, <laughs> I put people on my hip hop list that are not on the, the average people's, you know, KSR1 is my number one hip hop artist, and you almost never see him in the top five or the top 10. And to me, that's criminal because, you know, you can list all these people, you know, <laughs> Nas and Jay Z and, and Eminem and blah 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 blah. And it's like, okay, and ain't one of them people did you just put on that list and would even have a style if they didn't rip off KSR one verses on my philosophy. So <laughs> you know, like, you can name who you want to name, but my philosophy, bro. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. J I write a lot of lists like that and that's yeah. it's annoying when people write like they always put like the same thing as like you're just yeah. you know copy and pasting like you need to add like different artists or get newer artists like I really you know get annoyed when it's always like when you talk especially yeah. with, like I'm at, like you love music that's TV to me so and everyone's always yeah. like well it's Seinfeld and I'm like but there's been shows since then for me for me you know so it, it's interesting yeah. but you know, they just love the clickbait. Those Rolling Stone articles love, as long as you yeah. click, they don't care. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like, it's it's the same way with movies. You know, mm -hmm. you say, you know, best 90s movies. Okay, great. It's easy to say The Crow. It's easy to say this and this and this. Okay, mm -hmm. what about What's Eating Gilbert Grape? You Thank never you. see just... What's Eating Gilbert Grape on the list. You never see Once for Warriors on that list you never see you know x movies on those lists and the same with the 80s movies you say 80s movies oh you know uh this movie and this movie you know they the breakfast club and in in top gun and in et and okay great but what about you know these movies and movies that people don't think about and it's again it's sticking outside the box and just being willing to listen to or watch something that is out of your comfort zone or yeah, like you said with the uh, with music it's like food you got to try different foods yeah. um which speaking of i want to get to the meat and potatoes of this crush yeah. and i i do want to stress the meats because once upon a time you were managing an arby's when out of nowhere patty labelle walks in and before you get to the story i have to say this is it made me laugh because you always think of these like especially celebrities like her at these ritzy restaurants so for her to just walk <laughs> into an arby's i was like oh, what so yeah like let, let's hear the story so it wasn't Patty, really, actually. Um, I worked at a, an Arby's. I was manager. And we were getting ready to close for the night. Um, I had this routine that we went through because we had a mosque down the road from our Arby's. And our, our owner was Muslim. So his rule was is we could not close the restaurant before 10 p.m. Because the mosque a lot of the guys from the mosque would come down there 
to get food at the last minute, which was really frustrating because they would always roll in at like 9.50 and there'd be like 30 of them. And you're like, you fuckers. It's like 10 minutes before close and there's like 30 of you. And now I got to pull everything back out, blah, blah, blah. This one particular night, it had been really slow. I knew the mosque was closed. So we were all tore down. We were ready to walk out the door at 10 o'clock. So at 9.55, I'm standing by the door and this tour bus pulls it. And I'm like, oh, hell no. <laughs> like y'all didn't just bring a van, you brought a tour bus. <laughs> no, absolutely fucking not. So I locked the door. No, I look, I'm not, you can yell at me in the morning, whatever we're out. So I go to walk away and the door opens and this black guy gets out and he walks in the door and he's like six, five and 360 pounds, you know, looks like an NFL player. And he knocks on the door <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, bro, we're closed. He goes, oh, okay. Uh, was well, there any other restaurants around here open? And I'm like, I'm, I'm not sure, honestly. He's like, okay. He's like, I'll inform Miss LaBelle. Oh. Boom. I like flipped the lock and I, I went into the, the between the outer door and the inner door and I was like wait 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 hold up hold up LaBelle like Patty LaBelle and he goes yeah I'm her personal security uh we just finished the tour at Pine or we just finished the concert at Pine Knob and we're just looking for some place to uh eat our dinner that has tables and we're not crowded on the bus and I'm like come on come on <laughs> 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 you know <laughs> And, and I'm thinking to myself, how the hell am I going to explain this? Because I'm not going to be mad as hell that I let somebody into the restaurant like after 10, but technically it's not actually 10. So Patty come in and Patty had her hairdresser and her shoe lady and uh, had two security guards, had um, her clothing person. She had like her whole entourage with her because, you know, Patty travels with, she's got a, a dedicated shoe person for all of her shoes um who like in concert patty will kick her shoes off and sometimes they go into the audience oh so, this guy literally has the job of running into the audience and getting her shoes back by whatever means are necessary to get <laughs> her shoes back um, so they all come in and patty walks in she's got this huge wooden box and i was like how she got in a wooden box you know and she sets it on the counter where like the ketchup and all of that is and she opens it up and she starts pulling the things up and it's almost like a makeup kit it has things that raise oh, up yeah. mm -hmm. she's got every kind of hot sauce spice <laughs> she's got entirely basically she's got an entire kitchen in there except for a stove and I'm like oh okay so they order a whole ton of food and I'm standing there taking their order and I'm just like, holy shit, I'm serving like shitty roast beef sandwiches. <laughs> wow, you know, um, super, super kind woman. So funny. Like she was just being herself the whole directing traffic and making sure everyone was taken care of. And she ordered last. You know, she made sure everyone else was taken care of first and everyone had their order and whatnot. And, you know, it was surreal. And all of everyone that I had working with me, there was only one person out, out of the crew that was left that night. I had like five people still. There was only one person who even knew who she was. Even and, when you were like, it's Patty LaBelle, even when you said yeah, her name. So I was. It's crazy. I was disgusted with my crew because I was kind of like, <laughs> I can't believe y'all motherfuckers don't know who the fuck Patty LaBelle is. <laughs> You're like, like, I suggested they were fired, but he didn't listen to me. Yeah, and it was like, and I had a dude named Kwame. Kwame was standing in the back. And I was like, Kwame. He's like, what? <laughs> How the fuck you going to be black and don't know who Patty LaBelle is? <laughs> His parents didn't raise him right. Kwame's like, <laughs> Kwame's like, dude, I listen to Metallica. Oh, uh, was well. like, Kwame had an to Metallica. You grew up in a house listening to Metallica? He goes, no, my mom listened to R&B. That was like, you not know who Patty is. <laughs> and he's like, I just didn't pay attention, dude. And I was like, 
I was like, that's like, that's like growing up in New York and not knowing who Public Enemy is. You know, like, my brain couldn't wrap around that fact. And we made jokes about it, but we laughed and we had a good time. And I eventually, you know, we went out there and made sure they were, had everything they needed. And she was super kind. And of course, you know, I respectfully <laughs> told her that I had the hugest crush you know, whatnot. I made sure I was very respectful because, again, knew she was married for 30, almost 30 years at that point. Um, so she thought it was cute. She thought it was funny. Um, and we talked a little bit and, you know, she gave me this huge, massive hug and oh. I could have died right there and would have been perfectly <laughs> happy with my <laughs> life. Um, you know? Um, but when they were finished, they cleaned everything up and uh, she actually left a thousand dollars in tips for Oh wow. So um awesome night and um I didn't ask for an autograph because I figured meeting her and getting a huge hug was far more amazing than <laughs> signing some piece of paper um yeah i i, I feel like that and the thousand dollar tip that for you and the crew yeah, definitely like that would have made my day <laughs> yeah like she and the cool thing was is she didn't hand it to anybody she put it on the table um where her bodyguards were sitting and she kind of put it between the napkin thing and where the arby sauce bottles were wow so I was kind of glad like I actually went back into the lobby because she yeah. had picked everything up. So I didn't really have a reason to go back there. So I would have left and then the morning crew would have showed up and been like, oh shit, there's a thousand dollars on the table. You know? um, but yeah, she she left it very low key without saying anything. And um, it was cool. Like I, I loved it. And you know, one of my favorite stories to tell and uh again you know cool collected kind um everything you see about patty on tv is patty in real life you know well, she, you that's know. good to hear because sometimes you can meet a celebrity crush and it could just like break your heart but being an avid reader i want to know if you could relive that moment and you guys got to talking about books what is like a recent book that you would have recommended like well if you met her today and like same scenario you know got to talking a recent book you'd recommend to her knowing that she is religious i would probably recommend the book lamb the gospel according to biff jesus's childhood friend um mainly because one it's hilarious and hands down one of the funniest books I've ever read it uh, you know in the Bible you, you hear the story of when Jesus is born and then it skips ahead to the sort of Jesus and the last dinner and the crucifixion thing but it leaves out Jesus's life between point A and point Z. Mm, okay. Um, Just that gap. Yeah, Christopher Moore wrote a fictional take of where Jesus was between <laughs> A and Z. And it's told from the viewpoint of his best friend, Biff. And they go on all of these adventures to, to Persia and India and all of these things. And um, essentially the gist of the story is that since Jesus is perfect and can't sin uh, he lives vicariously through Biff. So Biff gets to experience all of these sinful pleasures that Jesus can't partake in. So you get this book that's one part Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and one part sort of Monty Python almost. <laughs> when, I, when I first was presented the book by my friend Carol, uh, she said, gotta read this book. And I was like, oh, it's a religious book. I wouldn't like it. She signed me the book. She said, read the damn book. And I don't want to read the book. Well, you know, how do you tell a black woman that you're not going to read the book that she spent money to buy and send to you? Because, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> she will come to your house and beat your ass with it. So um, I read Facts. the book. 
Yeah. So I, <laughs> I read the book and by probably the second page, I was almost in tears laughing. And I was just like, oh, this book is going to be brilliant because, you know, if I'm laughing this hard on the second page and by the, by the end of the book, I was just like, yes, most brilliant book I've ever read. Um, it takes on all of these religious situations, but he does it in a way that's not disrespectful. I mean, he's not making fun of religion or he's not, you know, bringing it down, but he's telling these sort of historical type tales um, with a lot of reverence to religion, but also in a very funny sort of Douglas Adams, Monty Python type of way. Um, so it really is one of those books that heathens like me love it but i've also had friends who were baptist and mormon who read the book and thought it was hilarious as well and weren't offended by biff having sex with a prostitute while jesus watched in the stall next to it <laughs> you know uh, it sounds like uh something the guys that created the boys would definitely try to um yeah, take much. to the big screen take to the very, amazon to make <laughs> very much uh christopher christopher moore has written probably i think 12 or 13 books now and every one of his books are just fall down funny uh very much in the style of the boys that sort of, you know, there's seriousness within the comedy, but there's a lot of sarcasm and there's a lot of, um, there's adult situations without them being Game of Thrones-ish, I guess, for lack of a better term. Like, they're not like explicit scenes, it's more implied. Um, so it's not like, okay, if your 14 year old kid wrote it, it wouldn't be anything that he really couldn't read. Um, but again, it's very tongue in cheek humor. It's, I won't call it dry humor because it's not really dry. Um, but it, but it has that, like I said, if you've ever read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it's very much in that vein. There's a lot of inside jokes and tongue in cheek and a lot of sarcasm and, um, a lot of humor that's just very funny. It's he, he has a knack for a really well placed joke, um, you know, and his jokes kind of come out of nowhere. So you'll be reading, and then he'll throw a joke in, and you're kind of like, "Oh, that's funny! That's funny, <laughs> funny!" You know, and it just sort of is there, but then he leaves it alone, gives it room to breathe, and you move on, and then he'll hit you again a little further on, and you know, like he just. I don't know. He has this very unique way of writing, but he uh, is one of my favorite authors. And I think that would definitely be a book that I think Patty would would love because of all the funny things and, um, you know, the situations. I think she would she would find humor in it. I'll say like you you got to meet her again. You recommended this book. You guys were both available. She asked you out hit things off what do you think your lives would be like together if you got to be with patty labelle in this chapter of her life <laughs> oh um i think patty would probably hate me i am i am i am way too much of a heathen probably <laughs> like just um well uh, you know as paul I mean, once said yeah like, attract. <laughs> yeah like i'm you know i'm just me like i'm I'm very much a Ragnar Rothrock type of guy. Like my Viking heritage and my Viking DNA is very, very strong in the sense that I just kind of go and do things on a whim and I live my life one minute at a time. So I think I would probably drive her absolutely insane in the sense that I don't really keep a schedule. I don't really work on the, the sense that a lot of people do, you know, as far as having routines and schedules and in that kind of thing. Uh, not that that's a bad thing or a good thing, but it's just, it's kind of how I am. So at this point, I probably, you know, <laughs> she'd, probably, she'd probably end up setting our bed on fire in the middle of the night. So. 
Oh, oh, oh God, with you in it. Oh no, yeah, Patty. No. with me in it. Um, Not an arson charge at seventy nine, yeah. Patty. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, and I just think very tongue in cheek. I, yeah, I think Patty would probably, you know, or maybe she would just bake me a really awesome sweet potato pie and slip a little rat poison in it or something. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, flowers in the attic style, slowly. Yeah, you know, like. <laughs> Like, Your Honor, I just cooked him a pie and he just keeled over, you know? Like, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, long story short, oh. I think I would probably make a horrible, horrible match with Patty. <laughs> um, I love her to death, but I mean, I'm very realistic in saying that. I would not be a good match for her at all. So. <laughs> well, arson and murder plots aside, we're gonna uh, move on, and we're gonna move on from Patty. Talk more about what you going on, got going on. But actually, first, I want to know where the obsession with music sort of started. I all because I interview a lot of musicians for a website, and I always wonder and ask: Was it an artist, an album, or a song that got you into music? Really, it was none of the above. It was. My dad is a truck driver. Uh, this is his 53rd year of driving truck. And my mom and dad divorced when I was two. Dad got sole custody and we did not have a house. We lived in his Peterbilt. So um, in 1973, 1974, 1975, uh, when I was young and impressionable, we lived in a Peterbilt truck and we traveled the country and you know there were no computers there were no laptops so there were no cell phones or any of that thing at the time so i had two things to entertain myself i had books and i had music and i spent my day sitting in the front seat of a peterbilt in a passenger seat reading and listening to music so i uh started out listening to what dad listened to which was a lot of classic rock and southern rock uh his favorite is bob seeger uh, but i got a lot of uh bad company boston uh grateful dead blackfoot leonard skinner marshall tucker that kind of stuff uh jerry reed uh eventually i had to go to school so yeah. <laughs> i stayed with my grandfather uh, on the farm while dad was out doing his thing and then i got introduced to classic country hank senior farron young hank snow uh conway twitty engelbert humperdinck that kind of stuff and you know and then my uncle marty come along and my uncle marty was into glam rock a lot of the stuff like slade and angel and uh roxy music david bowie uh electric light orchestra um, Bachman Turner Overdrive that kind of stuff so I got introduced to that and it just kind of you know I learned music in little pieces and as I've learned it I've kind of gone from one whim to another with it and it just snowballed into this again knowledge of music that it's not one dimensional you know like I'm I've, I've spent time in Brazil and Jamaica. So I got firsthand experience with reggae music and dance hall and bossa nova music. Um, I lived in, I spent a lot of time in the Philippines. So again, I got a lot of experience with local and indigenous bands from the Philippines. And uh, believe it or not, Filipinos are huge uh, metalheads. <laughs> So um, they love hard rock and, and metal music. So I experienced this, again, world clash of going to this country who it's one of the most beautiful places on earth and where I hope to retire and meeting these wonderful, amazing people thinking I had nothing in common with them. And, you know, meeting one of my friends and he's like, what are you listening to? And I'm like, well, you probably never heard of him. I'm listening to this band called Slayer. And he's like, I fucking love Slayer. And I was like, wait, <laughs> who Slayer is? He's like, hell yeah, Rain and Blood. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay, cool. You know, here's this kid who is 9,000 miles on the other side of the world for me. You know, 
that listens to this crazy band that again at the time wasn't even super popular you know so it, it again it shows you that people really are very much alike no matter where you go that there's similarities and i i've one of the biggest lessons takeaways for me is is you can look at life one of two ways you can look at life as we don't have this in common so i can't be your friend or you can look at life as okay maybe i don't have that in common with you but i have this 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 and this in common with you and hey if we just talk about this stuff and, and kind of just let this be what it is you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. like like if you meet somebody and the sole thing that you don't have in common is say you're liberal and they're conservative but you both have a love of movies. You both have a love of books. You both have a love of music. You both have a love of Chinese food. You both have a love of Monty Python films. You both have a love of of comic books. Do you throw all of those common interests away simply because you don't vote the same way? You know what I'm saying? Like that's, yeah. to me, that's insane. Like I get it if it's to the point, if the politics is to the point where it's, dangerous or yeah. insane oh, I totally get it you know what I'm saying hmm. but the problem is is again 60% of America isn't far left or far right they're kind of right in the middle you know they don't want to take your guns away but they do want gay marriage and they do want these rights and that's where a lot of people are a lot of people in this country are simply I don't care what you do or who you do it with. Just don't do it on my lawn and don't spend my money to do it. (laughs) You know, my mom is. Yeah. I was like, I I don't, my mom's like, you know what? I just, I hate everybody. Just leave me alone. (laughs) Yeah. I I had somebody tell me one time, well, you're a racist. I'm not racist. I hate everyone equally. Yeah. (laughs) Kind of like, I just want to be left alone. (laughs) Yeah. Like, leave me the fuck alone. Like, let me do my thing. (laughs) I won't take away your rights. You don't infringe on mine. And I will treat you like a human being. Because, exactly. again, it's one of them things. Being nice is not that freaking hard, people. You just it, have it, to smile and go about your day. <laughs> it takes so much more energy to be hateful than it does just to smile and do good. Be kind. You know, exactly. like it's, it's so easy to be kind. Like, why would you concentrate? Like, you have to purposely be hateful. Yeah, you're not takes- meant to be a hateful person. You're just not. So you can't convince me that you just are automatically an evil person. No, you choose to be evil. Unless you're just fucked up mentally ill. And excuse my language if, you know, but unless you're just mentally ill to the point that it's beyond your control. I understand that, but your average person isn't. They choose to be hateful. They choose to come out of their house and get into other people's business. They choose to road rage. They choose to act childish and act in ways that cause these situations that we see. And that's insane to me. You know, like I don't, I'm too old for that, I guess. And (laughs) I don't know, like it just takes too much energy. (laughs) it does but you know it also takes a lot of energy and it's a choice it's to get into podcasting and you decided you're gonna have your reactions and then your uh um the noise report but i want to know why do you think this facet of youtube with the reactions no matter if it's music or movies or just like events why do you think it's so fascinating for viewers to watch you know i don't know truthfully like i I started the reaction channel as a joke. I, I really did. Like I, I've always watched reactions, but when I watch them and they stop every 30 seconds, that drives me crazy. It, it just is like, dude, stop doing that. And I just thought to myself, I could do it better. And at the same time, I thought no one's going to want to listen to some 50 year old white guy react to music that very few people know about or is random, you know? And, okay, I'll probably get 20 viewers. 
And then I started it and I did a few and mm-hmm. on the day 364, I hit a million views and I had 14,000 subscribers. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And I thought, holy shit, maybe people do want to be your own white guy who talks about music. Um, because what people have, I think people have realized with my channel is I'm brutally honest and I don't hold back and I don't mince words. So I'm not scared to pick something apart and I don't overreact. You know, like I'm not one of these people that's going to throw their headphones or kick the chair over, oh, yeah. run around. Yeah. I'm like, dude, it's, you know, not that good of a line. Okay. Like you kick the chair over and <laughs> the floor. Like it, it, it was a good bar, but it wasn't that good of a bar, you know, like it, <laughs> It's, you know, um, it's like yeah, Kevin is, Smith. Uh, he always cries every every Marvel movie. Every everything makes him Dimash. cry. <laughs> Dimash, man, Dimash <laughs> makes me fucking cry every time. That the what? Dimash, the singer Dimash. Uh, if you've never heard him, this kid, he's from <laughs> Kazakhstan. He has a seven and a half octave vocal range seven and a half octaves okay now mm-hmm. to put that in perspective freddie mercury had five. <laughs> oh, wow <laughs> um dimash's vocal range is bigger than a piano keyboard it, it actually goes uh, i think it's 11 notes past what's on a piano so mm-hmm. when he sings he sings in a way that just touches you, touches your soul. This kid is, he, I, I don't know if I want to call him an angel or an alien, but <laughs> it's, I don't mean to cry, but Jesus, his voice is so out of this world. And the stuff he sings about, the themes of of peace and love and in how the destruction of war and that kind of stuff you know um i watch his videos and i know it's coming that's the thing like i know he's gonna hit these notes and i know he's gonna you know we know what damash does but it just you know it it makes me cry like every time i just i'm so moved by what he does and he's he's like 26 years old you know and I, I, I'm telling you right now, like for any listeners, if you have not heard Damash, it's D I M A S H. I'm telling you, you would never hear another singer like this kid. Like this kid is, this kid is like Freddie Mercury and Celine Dion put into one person. It, it's, it's out of this world. Like there's. I'm gonna, I'm gonna definitely look him up right after this because yeah, that like sounds he, wild. <laughs> Yeah, like you'll think he's Asian. Uh, he's he's from Kazakhstan. His mom is uh, uh, Chinese, and his dad is like Russian. Um, so you know he has a, an Asian look to him, but you know he's Russian and Chinese essentially. That's what the Kazakhstan people. That's what they're a mix of. And, well, um, other than um, Dimash potentially being on the Noise Report, are there any like? And, and of course, Patty LaBelle. Who would you like to sit down with in the, like the coming year? Who's like a bucket list artist for you? Man, I just, Dimash. <laughs> yeah, like I just did Jeff Scott Soto, who was like my number one on my bucket list because he's like one of my favorite singers of all time. Um, I've actually done three of my top five off my bucket list, and I've done like six out of the top ten. Uh, but as for who I would love to sit down with, um, Unrealistically, David Gilmore would be number one on my list. Pink Floyd is my favorite all-time band. Um, realistically, Justin Furstenfeld of Blue October would be probably number one right now, realistically. Um, Blue October, again, another band that makes me cry every time. Um, Jared from Bowling for Soup would be huge. Um uh, Love Bites from Japan, the all-female metal band. Um, Maximum the Hormone, uh, or you may know them as the band that does the theme for Death Note, um, would, would be huge <laughs> for me. Um, 
uh, I'm obsessed with like the Japanese rock and metal. Uh, so you'll see a lot of that. Um, a guitarist out of Indonesia named Alik Bata uh, would be amazing to speak with. Um, Colt Ford, uh, if you kind of like country and hip hop. Um, I've actually interviewed Chris Calico and him and Chris Calico have a new project called The Hoodbillies uh, that they're getting ready to release. Um, Tech Nine would be amazing. I'd love to do Tech Nine or Hobson. Um, would both be huge for me. Uh, Chuck D of Public Enemy and KSR One <laughs> would be another one. Um, I don't know if I could actually interview KSR One because I would sound really stupid. Like I would fanboy um, hard over. Yeah, KSR. there's some people that you're like, I'm gonna be cool, but I, I think those heroes and those kind of idols are just like, no, like I like I could never talk to Conan O'Brien. Like, like no. Like, like KSR One, you know, they call him the teacher because if you've ever heard KSR One speak, this man is next level when it comes to, you know, African American studies and, and history and and that kind of stuff and the stuff that he speaks about, or is that I'm I'm not versed in it in the sense that I would need to be like I could speak to him about hip hop per se, mm -hmm. but. I don't, you know, I'm not well versed in black history and civil rights and the the stuff that Chris really is an expert on. So, you know, my knowledge would be limited to hip hop. And I, I just feel like that would cheat. It would cheat the listeners for me as a white guy to interview KSR1 and not let KSR1 just kind of be who he is, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's one I, I would probably, I would avoid that one and leave it <laughs> to people who are better suited for it, you know, out of respect for him because I love KSR1. Like, he, again, he's number one on my hip-hop list. Um, well, so. these bucket list ones, you know, on the back burner, but who do you have coming up on the show, on the Noise Report in the coming weeks? Um, I have... Uh, what do I have? I have a wrestling podcast coming up. Um, from a, uh, it's a gentleman from a show called Steve Does Everything. Uh, he's a wrestling expert, and we did the uh, greatest of all time wrestling tournament. It's a two parter that's coming up. Um, I have Andy Halt from uh, Zero King coming up. Um, I have one I'm recording tonight. Uh, from uh, he's the drummer of a band I love called The Reticent, out of North Carolina, and um. He, we're, we're going to talk about the festival they have coming up and stuff he has going on. And uh, I've got a few others that I'm working. Uh, now that I've interviewed Jeff, it opened up a lot of doors to people. Um, so I'm hoping to have one soon that is related to one of my favorite all-time movies, Iron Eagle. Uh, <laughs> so it will be someone related to Iron Eagle. Uh, and... Um, that's kind of what I have planned like right now, but um, I've always, I've always kind of come across stuff sort of last minute and very randomly. So you never know what you like. I got to interview Lloyd Kaufman of, you know, the trauma, oh. trauma movies and mm -hmm. uh, Toxic Avenger and that. And that was just very random. Like <laughs> I was sitting at the house and I interviewed somebody and, you know, we started talking about that and they were like, hey, you want to interview Lloyd? And wait, what? Hell, I'd love to interview Lloyd Kaufman. Lloyd Kaufman doesn't do interviews. Mm -hmm. well, apparently Lloyd does, but you have to know somebody who knows somebody to get to Lloyd. Like uh. Lloyd doesn't just take random interviews. You have to be recommended by somebody. So since I was recommended by one of his friends, Lloyd did the interview with me and we talked about, you know, the Toxic Avenger and all the trauma stuff and again total fanboy moment because um i love a great cheesy slasher horror movie you know <laughs> so um you know it was right in my wheelhouse of of stuff that i love so um yeah you never know with me 
Like it could be pop culture, it could be music, it could be movies, it could be books. Uh, I'm open to talking to anybody. Really, it doesn't matter. Like I, you know, I'm on. I'm a man of many talents. I like to say, you know, I wouldn't call myself a Renaissance man because, you know, I don't think I'm that talented, but um, I am knowledgeable and stuff that people wouldn't expect from <laughs> me. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's a good skill or a, g- a good thing to have in your back pocket, those factoids and everything. But before we sign off, I did want to do a quick speed round based around music uh, for the music odd. Are you up for it? Oh, yes. All right. Which movie has the best soundtrack? Iron Eagle. Album that you would say saved your life? Portraits from Dan Fogelberg, I think. Uh, the worst album from one of your favorite artists, because they can't all be perfect. Oh man, um, I'm gonna say Boston Three, because I'm such a massive fan of the first two. That when the third one come out, and they started with the song Amanda, and then the rest of the record just completely <laughs> fell off the cliff. So, a Boston Three was a terrible record, short of like two songs. <laughs> <laughs> And then a song that you think is perfectly constructed from start to finish. Leader of the Band by Dan Fogelberg. Uh, it's uh, it, it, one of two songs that makes me cry every single time because the way I relate to it. And I know my dad is a truck driver and I'm the one that's into music. But, you know, Dan kind of tells a story of his dad being a man of music and him being a musician and being on the road it really it kind of hits my soul because you know dad was always on the road and away from home and um it's kind of reversed from the song where i was at home and he was on the road but you know of all the times that were missed and the constant worry as a kid and a teenager of something could happen to him and Mm -hmm. you know and yeah just uh there, there's a line in there um, where he says, Papa, I don't think I've said I love you near enough. And that's the part that just... It's... Yeah, like there's there's a lot of bad blood still on that side of the family due to the racism and, you know, that stuff. Um, but that's still my dad, you know. That's still the reason I'm here. So... Past all the, yeah, like past all the bad blood, past all the different things. That's still, that's still my papa, you know. And uh, you know, I I haven't got, I haven't gotten to say I love you in thirty one years. So it, uh, yeah, that one hits. (laughs) I totally get it. Yeah, I get that, especially with like the races. I I mix, so there's part of the family that's a little reckless. Yeah, that's, um, that's and, what I'm saying. Like, I walked away from it because, look, I'm I'm an adult, and I'm I'm not going to put myself around it, and I'm not going to put my kids around it. Um, but that, you know, like, look, you can, you know, it's toxic, and you 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 stay away from it, but that doesn't diminish who they are or the memories you have with them or the stuff you, the the good stuff you learned mm-hmm. from. It. You know, I learned to survive in the country. I learned to grow a garden and I learned to to live off the land and I learned respect in the sense of you know opening doors for a lady and saying yes ma'am and no ma'am and thank you and goodbye and just a, a simple as you're walking past someone a, 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 a head nod you know to acknowledge them um, that's what I took away from that is respect you know uh even if it wasn't even if it was from somebody who didn't respect everybody i can respect everybody you know what i'm saying so um they taught me the principles and i had to expand on that as a teenager and adult and i've done that you know and i've made sure to not follow in the those viewpoints or in those paths of of, of what they believed, you know, and uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I 
I wanted to end it there, but I, I do have one more speed round because it's mm -hmm. my favorite thing in the world because I love MTV. A music video that you feel is pure art. Peter Gabriel Sledgehammer. So that's a good one. Uh, it had it sort of had that Max Hutton type of vibe to it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was such a catchy song. Sledgehammer. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it, that was it's a very artsy video at the time uh, uh also dire straits money for nothing was one that was way ahead of its time as far as animation and in what they did uh in that video um so i think those are the two that stand out to me and in new attitude by patty labelle as well because again it showed her and you know with a sense Only of light <laughs> yeah like it did well i mean it was it showed so many aspects of who she was and again being part of beverly hills cop it fit that vibe of the movie you know with mm -hmm. the with everything that was going on in beverly hills cop you know um and eddie's character in that movie it, it really fit the whole vibe so um neutron dance and new attitude both were perfect examples of that time and era and what the movie was about you know that sort of lightning in a bottle time capsule of that time period you know it uh those, those are the best types of uh videos that yeah. you just can or, and music just pop culture in general when it just it yeah. just fits that you're like that's 80s that's 90s yeah that's unfortunately 2000s um so i would do want to ask you before we go if you can remind everyone where they can find you and all your musical wonders online yeah i again uh if you just go to google music god cj plane you will find everything a music god reacts is the youtube channel uh or if you want to go to the website and read uh my insane ramblings and reviews and different things i've got there uh it's riot on the set media dot rocks r-o-c-k-s tiktok instagram i think are all music god cj plain and um that site that whether you still have twitter or whether you have x uh, it's music got CJ playing on there, but I don't think I've posted in like five years. It's mostly just random crap on there because if you're going to limit me to 45 characters, then you can sort of kiss my whole entire butt. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to try to paraphrase what I have to say in 45 characters or less. So um, I don't really post there. But thank you. Thank you for. <laughs> allowing me to be insane on here. Well, I, I was going to say thank you for taking the time to talk about your May, December crush and music with me today. And everyone, you can find all the Music Gods information below. And until next time, as always, keep crushing it. Crushgasm is part of the I Did Not Make These Rankings podcast network alongside some other pretty cool shows, including An Evening at the Movies, Crime, Rewind, Literature Reapers, Love is Black, Masturbators, Men are the Prize, and The Sibless. You can find all of us and more over at IDNMTRPodcastNetwork.com.